A great boss fight should generally feel like an extension of the game you played before it, an ultimate test of all the things you've learned and been taught throughout the game mechanically. That's not to say it's necessarily a crap boss fight if it doesn't do this, but it does take you aback when a boss fight mechanically has very little to do with all the gameplay techniques the game has taught you so far. That's precisely what we'll be digging into in this list, the boss encounters whose combo of mechanics and vibe took a huge step away from the gameplay we'd come to expect, and more importantly, spent time getting really good at until that point. I'm Jess from More Culture, and here are 10 boss fights that play totally different to their games. Number 10, Ms. Ruby, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. This is a boss fight you'll probably either remember really fondly for its very cool vibe, or really not fondly if the sharp left hand turn into a rhythm game was not something you were prepared for. Ms. Ruby, for those who haven't had the pleasure, is an alligator, voodoo practitioner, and enemy of Sly Cooper as part of the Fiendish Five. Her boss encounter is a little unusual though. Despite spending most of Sly Cooper platforming, slashing, sneaking about, and collecting stuff, you'll need to trade all of that expertise for the ability to press the right button on your PlayStation controller at the right time to get by Ms. Ruby. The Haitian Gator will shoot various collections of PlayStation button prompts at you and you'll need to collect them at exactly the right time so you don't get Sly knocked off his precarious turtle or other pedestal. It's actually a very cool boss fight, even if the game does completely change genres for a bit there to make it happen. That said, you might not find it cool thanks to the combo of Ms. Ruby changing up the pacing the further in you get, and the fact that the button presses don't always register when you expect them to. Number 9, Rafe, Uncharted 4. Uncharted 4 is an excellent game and a wonderful conclusion to Nathan Drake's story. That said, it does have a final fight whose gameplay mechanics are way far away from anything else you've done up until that point. That said, it does ensure it's pretty unforgettable. The Uncharted series is underpinned by encouraging stealth, arena gunfights, exploration, and environmental traversal through platforming. Sword fights and quick time events don't enter into the equation much at all, but in the final fight of Uncharted 4 against Rafe, sword fights and quick time events is exactly what you'll get. Fun fact, Uncharted 4 was actually supposed to feature a flashback with Sam and Nate fighting with swords in the mansion as kids, which would have served as a tutorial for this final fight. This ended up being cut, so the sudden fencing scene, while admittedly awesome, comes out of left field even more than it was intended to. At no other point in the game do you encounter a sword fight, so the game is actually prompting you with how to block attacks and deliver blows in the middle of the climactic final battle. At the beginning of the fight, Rafe actually asks Nate if he knows how to sword fight. No Rafe, no we don't, the game never taught us, but we're about to learn. Quickly. Number 8, Gygas, Earthbound. Earthbound is an aesthetically adorable RPG that hit the SNES in 1994. The game calls for you to take on enemies with your party, explore the game world, and help save the world from an alien threat. That's all fine and dandy, but the final fight against Gygus, who appears as a howling black and red void, is one part traumatizing, one part completely out of the blue, and one part impossible to win. At least not in the way you've been playing the entire rest of the game. Prey is your party member Paula's special ability. It triggers a random effect, sometimes restoring hit points or psychic points, but it's otherwise seen to be, well, useless if we're not putting it lightly. That is until your absolutely horrifying final encounter with Gygus, where Paula's prey ability seriously comes in clutch. In what is a genuinely haunting turn, the only way to ultimately stop Gygus is to pray nine times once he's reached his final form. The ability causes those the party has met along their travels to think of the group and pray for their safety. The final prayer is actually directed at the player themselves. It's very intense, very out of step with the rest of the gameplay, but honestly pretty darn cool. Number 7, The Final Twist, A Way Out. I've been pretty vague on the title here because I do not want to spoil this ending if you haven't gotten through the game yourself and intend to, so go along and meet me at number 6 if you haven't played it. Otherwise, here we go. Alright, for the rest of you, A Way Out is another narrative spectacular from Haze Light, a studio you probably know from the stunning Brothers A Tale of Two Sons or the more recent It Takes Two. 
A Way Out fills a sorely lacking niche as a genuine split-screen co-op story-based action-adventure, with each player taking control of one of the two main characters, Vincent and Leo. You break out of prison together, sneak around, play minigames, engage in the narrative, and so on. There's little in the way of combat, as you'll be figuring things out far more than participating in shootouts. That is until the end, where surprise, you're in a 1v1 third-person shooter. Good luck! Yep, all that cooperation and hard-earned knowledge of the mechanics is pretty useless now as it's revealed you're not on the same side at all. And now you're hustling around a roof with an AK like it's a COD match, trying to take out your buddy before he takes you out. Then you'll need to smack each other in the face through quick time events and then tap your little heart out to get to the gun lane between you first, where you'll shoot your co-op partner, win the game that you just found out as a competition, and try not to spend the rest of the night in an argument. Number 6. Sauron – Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor Shadow of Mordor has plenty of fans, and it's for good reason. There's plenty of things to do, abilities to earn, and elite enemies to take out. Talion's story, his growth as a fighter, and taking on main and story missions is the bread and butter of the game. Beyond those elements, the game has an entire core combat feature, the Nemesis system, that has been lauded for its ingenuity. So there's a whole bevy of systems, RPG elements, and fighting techniques you've gotten your head around in the game's 20-ish hour runtime that the game can draw from in its epic final standoff with Sauron, right? Right? Nope, and to the disappointing gameplay switch up that's here to mess up not only this entry, but multiple entries on this list. Quick time events. Despite a promising initial battle with the Talons of the Black Hand that does actually require you to use your combat know-how and abilities, the last fight with Sauron himself sets itself up to be totally epic, only to ask you to execute exactly five button presses before the big bad is donezo. Thank goodness you did all that grinding just so you could get strong enough to know how to click a button at the right time. Number 5. Liquid Ocelot – Metal Gear Solid 4 – Guns of the Patriots Metal Gear Solid boss fights could easily take up a bunch of entries on this list, as there's often boss fights that include a bunch of gameplay you wouldn't expect to see, but we're here to talk about Metal Gear Solid 4. Metal Gear Solid 4 is largely punctuated by its stealth gameplay, close quarters combat, and gunplay. Now, the face-off between Old Snake and Liquid Ocelot is absolutely epic, but I don't think anybody saw the mechanics of this one coming. A boss fight that doesn't follow the gameplay expectations set up within the rest of the experience isn't necessarily bad. It can be really cool. Case in point. After an extended cutscene, the encounter shifts genres and mechanics entirely and emulates a classic fighting game. Both combatants are given health bars, the camera shifts to a 2D perspective, and the iconic game soundtrack kicks up in the background, making the whole scene seriously powerful and emotional, especially when starts playing. The extended brawling sequence goes on for some time, requiring you to learn and execute blocks and counterattacks effectively. It's absolutely a vibe, completely different gameplay mechanic-wise to the rest of the game, but still a vibe. Number 4. Killer Croc – Batman Arkham Asylum Killer Croc's major encounter in Arkham Asylum asked players to relearn pretty much everything they've learned so far in order to, well, not get the Batman killed. Rocksteady's action-adventure often asks you to romp through Gotham, use detective vision, and beat up on hordes of baddies with your bat arsenal. What it rarely requires you to do is slow right down and accept that you might not be able to punch your problems away. This is what happens when you're faced with the Killer Croc boss fight. The encounter is really well designed to ensure you feel uncomfortable and tense. There are entire periods of this fight where nothing happens. You need to proceed slowly and quietly through the flooded tunnels so Killer Croc doesn't get the drop on you. Utilize your line launcher and be prepared with a batarang when Croc does come charging at you. It's a really long drawn out boss fight, and at the end of it, the game just tells you to run so you don't get smashed to smithereens. The fact that this fight is completely off pace with the rest of the gameplay makes sense. You're in the sewers where Croc has a serious advantage. It makes the fight really unique, especially since your final task is just to get out of there alive, running like mad toward the camera. Number 3. Rays – Dying Light the gameplay of Techland's 2015 zombie game Dying Light is largely based on parkour and zombie decimating combat. You'll be keeping an eye out for survivors to save, side missions to cross off, and ways to level up your character to become the undead swerving slayer of your dreams. That overview out of the way, let's talk about the final boss fight. 
Your journey brings you face to face with Raze, a warlord who stands as the game's primary antagonist. In short, Raze is a real piece of crap, and the idea of unleashing all the abilities you've gained and combat techniques you've learned onto him is a huge drive in getting to the end of the story. That is, until the fight begins and you realize the game has unfortunately traded all of that fan favorite gameplay for a quick time heavy encounter. Trading all of its gameplay mechanics for a basic sequence of QTEs is especially bizarre as there are no quick time events throughout the rest of the game. Certainly none that are utilized in what would be hugely impactful encounters with antagonists. You're on top of a building right in front of the biggest douche in the city and all you can do is wait for button prompts to execute. Number 2. Higgs – Death Stranding After that epic Metal Gear Solid 4 boss battle we covered off on earlier that admittedly didn't have a lot gameplay-wise to do with the rest of the game, Hideo Kojima delivers again in Death Stranding. While a whole lot more divisive than the Metal Gear series, Kojima proves yet again with Death Stranding that he still knows how to make a video game moment stand out, and that sometimes he does that by switching genres entirely. Toward the end of the game, after offing the biggest BT you'll ever see, you come up against Higgs himself. The start of the fight has you running around the pesky, regularly cloaking antagonist while Higgs attempts to put a bullet in your head. But by the end of the fight, takes a generous page out of Metal Gear Solid 4's book and goes full classic fighter on you. Complete with health bars and dramatic injury close-ups, this genre swap is definitely unexpected, but it's still classic Kojima in the best possible way. Number 1. Branch D's Final Boss – Drakengard 3 Drakengard's setting, plot, and branching endings are all fairly complex already before you throw in mad gameplay left-hand turns. But of course, we get mad gameplay left-hand turns as well. For most of the PS3 JRPG, you'll be engaging in hack-and-slash combat and aerial battles where you'll be attacking from a dragon. There are multiple weapon types that can be leveled, ground-based combos to master, and some rail shooter style missions. You get the gist. What the game never features are super tricky rhythm game sections, right up until the boss fight at the end of the fourth and final timeline branch, because that's exactly how this fight goes down. Basically, you're all of a sudden playing Guitar Hero on Expert 30 odd hours into this otherwise traditional JRPG. Well, Guitar Hero aboard a giant dragon while slowly rotating around gigantic flower ladies. Players reported the fight was absolutely maddening thanks to the combination of a wildly unreliable camera that's clearly on the boss's side, zero checkpoints, the boss absorbing the screen and being the same color as the rings so you can't see the rings you need to be hitting, and an absolutely cheap move where the final note you need to hit appears when the screen is completely dark and everyone's acting like the sequence is over. Screw up once and it's back to the beginning of the 8 minute sequence with you. It's a total troll. I did say that just because a boss fight plays differently to the rest of the game doesn't necessarily make it bad. This is one of the exceptions, this one's definitely bad. And that's our list! Do let me know down in that comment section if you can think of any other boss fights that play completely differently to the rest of their games. As always, I've been Jess from What Culture. thank you so much for hanging out with me. You can come say hi to me on my Twitter if you like, where I'm at JessMcDonald, but make sure you stay tuned to us here for plenty more great content.